Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. It's called Arizona Law SB 1070, and it's drawing both protest and praise all across the country. At the heart of the firestorm, what should be or can be done to control illegal immigration in this country? Joining me here in the studio is Christina Rodriguez, a law professor at NYU. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by Doris Meissner, a senior fellow at the Migration Policy Institute and a former INS commissioner, and Dan Stein, who's president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. As always, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this web show, Dove. Let me start with you, Christina, if I could. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of debate and discussion about this law. It certainly is, has been very heated. Can you, for everyone's purpose, just explain briefly what this law does? The law actually has many parts, but they, there are two that have attracted a lot of the attention. The first is that the law makes it a crime to be in the state of Arizona without complying with federal registration requirements. And that's the first law of that kind that's been passed by states. So federal registration requirements, what do you mean by that? There's, there's a provision in the federal code that requires that aliens who enter the United States register. And there's some people who are exempted from those requirements for humanitarian and other reasons. But in general, aliens are required to register with the government to notify them when they change address and also to carry proof either in their passport or in the form of a green card that they have law authorization to be in the U.S. And so the Arizona law adds a penalty f through the state system to people who haven't complied with those provisions. But it's a lot, a lot of the discussion has been focused on law enforcement. That's right. Law enforcement has the ability to stop someone who is uh, who would be stopped otherwise for some kind of violation, whether it's a blinker that doesn't work or excess speed, and then ask the individual to show proof that they are in this country legally, right? That's so right. whatever documentation, and what kind of documentation would that be, like a driver's license? Well, a driver's or? license, that's the second major component of the law that's drawn most of the criticism and the charges of racial profiling. It, it directs police that when they lawfully come into contact with, contact with someone in a stop or an arrest, that they ask for their identification. And if you have an Arizona ID, I believe also a tribal ID, or some other form of ID where proof of lawful status is required, you're presumptively okay. If you don't have ID, then that might produce another series of questioning. And if the officer has reason to believe or reasonable suspicion that the person's present unlawfully, then they can check immigration status, inquire into immigration status. And, and Doris, when you, actually, I know they're fixing your mic right now, but uh, wait, that's all right. When, when you look at this law, what is your biggest complaint about it? Well, my biggest complaint is really based on my own experience being responsible for the Immigration and Naturalization Service and for setting priorities on what law enforcement at the federal level should be and for being responsible for carrying out Congress's instructions and the resource allocations that Congress gives, as well as the overall responsibilities to administer the immigration law. What Arizona does and what the Arizona do law does is basically take that responsibility and vest it with the state and with state law enforcement officials. That means that the federal government, in carrying out federal responsibilities to enforce the immigration law, is no longer in charge of setting priorities and determining the best ways to carry out its mandate. And Dan, I imagine that people who support the, this law, such as yourself, would say to Doris, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but you can, you can elaborate on this, that the federal government wasn't fulfilling its responsibility in terms of handling the number of illegal immigrants in the state of Arizona. Is that accurate? Well, that's close. I mean, look, it's Congress that ultimately decides under the Constitution how many people come in, who they are, and how we enforce the rules. Now, increasingly, the executive branch is saying, well, we have such broad latitude in deciding whether to enforce the, the, the rules that millions and millions of people can come and violate those laws and violate those rules, and now we, the executive, can simply come back to Congress every 10 years and say, oh, hey, there's three million people here illegally. Congress, you need to retroactively give them all green cards. And we're saying, no, that's not the way it's supposed to work, and that without a proper integration of federal and state enforcement. Uh, we're going to continue to see the atrophy of immigration enforcement throughout the country. 
And people today are recognizing that unless states are partners working, yes, within the constitutional and, and federal statutory framework, but are partners with the federal government in ensuring that immigration laws are enforced at key intervention points, we're never going to get control of illegal immigration. Now, Doris, that sounds pretty reasonable. Why not let the states partner with Congress to enforce the laws that are currently on the books? In fact, we got a tweet from someone saying, being here illegally is against the law. Does the American government not want to enforce the law? What is, what's your reaction to that? It is true that being here illegally is against the law. And the federal government, in carrying out its immigration enforcement responsibilities, does partner with state government and local government, has been doing so for many, many years. It partners with them through federal uh, directed law enforcement task forces. It partners with them on criminal alien removal programs. It partners with them on a program that's become very controversial called 287G, which is the section of the statute that it's named after, where the federal government delegates the authority and responsibility for implementing the law. But all of those partnerships and relationships are based on the federal government taking the leadership and setting the priorities for the kinds of cases to focus on and for the training and the skills that are required in order for state and local federal uh, state and local law enforcement officials to help enforce the federal law the Arizona law flips that in the other direction and says we in Arizona will decide how it is that we go about enforcing immigration law and that really rearranges the federal government's responsibilities here. Everybody realizes that the current immigration laws are inadequate, that the current enforcement is insufficient to the rate of violation of the immigration laws that exists. But that can only be solved by changing the laws, strengthening them, putting better laws on the books, it is not going to be solved by states like the state of Arizona taking the law and implementing it in their own way, and arguably lots of other states deciding to implement the law in their way. Right. Then we get real chaos. I want to get into the overall immigration policy in this country, which seems to be the heart of the matter in a moment. But before I do, Christina, I know the Justice Department, of course, has has basically sued Arizona, saying that the federal law basically agreeing with Doris mm -hmm. Trump's state law. And this is uh, the purview of the federal government. Do you think the case has merit? There is merit in the case because it's traditionally the case in the Supreme Court's precedent that immigration control and law is the province of the federal government. But the key question is what you mean by immigration law. And the Supreme Court has also said that not everything that affects immigrant movement or that's intended to deter illegal immigration is preempted either constitutionally or by the statute. Can so you not talk like a law professor? <laughs> <laughs> Does it need to explain it in sort of simpler sure. terms so for that, somebody who doesn't have a law degree? So the idea is that the Constitution assigns responsibility to the federal government to regulate immigration. But the Supreme Court has said that even though that's true, not everything that the state does that might impact immigrants in some way or that might be targeted at preventing illegal immigration is preempted. So the key question really is whether what Arizona is doing is in conflict with the federal government's ability to enforce its law. And that to me is the, the, the and crux what do you think? of the is issue. It? I think that by adding conditions to unlawful presence, this crime that I started out by discussing, it does add something to the federal scheme that the federal government doesn't intend. I think it's also the case that if you have police in Arizona constantly calling the federal government asking for a verification of status, that could have an impact on the way the federal government enforces its law. The federal government is clearly focused on serious aliens, on uh, serious offenders. And if they're having to field these requests in high volume, then it might interrupt that ability to enforce and shift from what the federal government would rather do. That, in a lot of ways, is a factual 
question. And it's helpful to have the government intervene and say, this does interfere with our enforcement. But I think it's also open to, to question how credible that claim ultimately is, given what the law requires police to do. Well, you know what? We have another tweet. Let, let, let me give this to you, Dan. Don't numerous other states have similar laws to Arizona? In Europe, this person says everyone is uh -huh, supposed to carry official ID. Is Arizona really alone in this, or are there similar laws in, in other states? Well, there's a, there's a national movement uh, nationwide, and I'm proud of the role that FAIR is playing in trying to help American citizens and states bring this about uh, to help, as I say, integrate state laws with federal enforcement to, to leverage what we believe are invitations from Congress since, certainly since the mid-1990s, to have more state participation in assisting enforce these laws. And yes, there are some novel provisions in the Arizona law, but many of them have been enacted elsewhere. And what I find, frankly, somewhat political in the administration's attack on Arizona is that when New York State and others uh, have, were issuing driver's licenses to people here illegally, or when there were sanctuary resolutions, so-called, where uh, local officials intentionally did not cooperate with federal enforcement officials, um, we never heard anything from this administration or the prior administration complaining that these state and local activities would be interfering with federal enforcement priorities when clearly not only were they, they were affirmatively interfering with, obstructing, even encouraging federal law breaking. So the big challenge for the Obama administration is this lawsuit is being seen through partisan political lenses. The fact that they did not raise the racial profiling issue significantly in their initial complaint suggests that many of the president's initial public concerns are in fact not merited by the evidence of what we see so far. And we predict that Arizona, for the most part, that law is, 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 is going to be upheld, well drafted. Um, I think you're going to see similar laws passed in other states. And we all want, what we all want to see ultimately is to bring about an enforceable immigration legal structure. And the president himself at American University said the other day, our immigration laws have become unenforceable. Now, the administration says their so-called comprehensive immigration reform, which we see as a big amnesty bill, is supposed to fix the system. The problem is there's no bill. Nobody really believes that the proposals they're talking about are going to fix the system. And, but then they turn around and when, you know, law-abiding state legislators try to fashion what we feel is a very constructive partnership legislation like SB 1070, they're bringing all kinds of lawsuits to try to stop it. So, you know, if the president doesn't like Arizona, his first obligation should be to say to the people of Arizona, all right, I don't like what you're doing here. Let's work together to tweak it. Let's change it. You're on the right track, but we need to make some changes. No, he's attacking the whole thing. And then he's turning around and he's not offering an alternative, frankly, that most people would support. Well, what about the racial profiling aspect of this, Doris? Do you find that troubling? I know there are specific sort of stipulations required of law enforcement before someone is stopped. In other words, they have to be doing something illegal. It can't be based solely on race. I know the law was rewritten to reflect that. And it seems to me that this would open up a lot of people to unnecessary harassment. Is that something, Dan or Doris, that I'm... Uh, concerns you in any way? Doris, well, why don't we we'll start with you? Sure. Well, the, I mean, the profiling, the potential for profiling uh, is absolutely a concern. States like Arizona and many other states in the country, in fact, much of the country, has a broad mixture of population, legal and illegal, that are from the same nationality backgrounds. So that Although it is absolutely legitimate for law enforcement to take national origin into account as one of a number of factors in determining reasonable suspicion, in a state like Arizona, they're very likely going to be making arrests improperly based on the mixture of legal and unauthorized people that are in that population. The additional factor that makes it very difficult where those with legal status is concerned is that, as Christina said, a driver's license is certainly the most obvious form of identification that is used, but 
everybody does not have a driver's license and you can be in the country legally and not have a driver's license but also have a document which is not immediately obvious as either a legal document or an illegal document. So determining who is actually in the country legally, particularly for people who are citizens who are not required to carry documents, that's where the danger rests. And Dan, you're getting exasperated. Why? <laughs> well, you know, I've been at this 30 years, <laughs> so I guess as Doris, although she doesn't look that old. <laughs> but honestly, I find it ironic that many of the same organizations that are claiming of this threat about racial profiling are the same organizations that for years have fought against the introduction of unitary identification standards that would minimize the question of invidious discrimination in, in questioning or stopping and searching. Look, the federal government operates under certain kinds of rules relating to stop and search for Border Patrol agents within a certain distance of the border. There's, there are certain constitutional standards that would not normally apply to state enforcement in other contexts. And the Arizona law has been crafted specifically with that sensitivity in mind, recognizing that we do not want law enforcement op officers operating as if they are the equivalent of the Border Patrol operating, say, within 10 miles of the border. It sets up important protections to ensure that there is a secondary basis for an inquiry into a person's status in the country. And as American citizens, we ought to try to operate on the assumption, as, as our courts do, by the way, that law enforcement authorities will respect the law, will obey the law in the course of carrying out their duties. The least we can do is respect the people of Arizona and their law enforcement officials and assume that they're going to do their best to adhere to both federal, well, certainly the constitutional norms and 14th Amendment standards and the specific provisions of SB 1070 and not engage in racial profiling in, in any manner that's inconsistent with what, you know, might be implied by what would be required under the specific terms of the law. Remember, immigration law is civil law. It's not criminal law. The vast majority of people coming into this country illegally are coming from Mexico, are coming from countries south of the border. It is a reality that, <clears throat> that, that, that there's going to be disproportionate impact. If you give amnesty, most of the people who benefit will be Mexican nationals. If you enforce immigration laws, the vast majority of people who are going to be affected by that are going to be from certain countries where you see the most illegal immigrants coming. We can't change that reality. But, but people are using that reality to say, there's no way we can enforce the law effectively in the interior. And our concern is we can't continue down this road of, of effectively dysfunction and a breakdown in our enforcement apparatus um, with, by saying everything we try is somehow either not going to work or illegal or dysfunctional. This Arizona law, Christina, mm -hmm. wouldn't be necessary if the immigration okay. policy in this country and the enforcement of that policy actually worked, in my opinion. I mean, that's just a layperson's observation. What is wrong with the current immigration policy? Why are there so many illegal mm -hmm. immigrants who aren't going through the proper channels mm -hmm. to either get into this country or to become citizens of this country. Is it just the system completely broken? I think that's a very complicated question, but it's the core of the issue. And there are a lot of reasons that there's illegal immigration. I think one is that the population is responsive to the labor market and the housing boom that's now a bust and all kinds of economic conditions that drew people here from Mexico from a place where there weren't jobs to a place where there was a demand for their labor. So that's a really strong economic logic that's difficult to enforce your way out of. But it's also the case, and this is what most people don't focus on, that it's very difficult to enter the country legally if you don't have family connections that enable you to get a family visa, which makes up the bulk of the visas to the United States. And that even those systems and the employment systems that exist are incredibly back backlogged, especially for countries like Mexico, where the vast majority of unauthorized immigrants come. And so there's also the problem of lack of legal avenues for entry. So it's the two things in tandem. And then I think there's the enforcement piece as well, where the government has made decisions about who it's going to enforce the law against and who it's not. And so it's put more resources at the border, fewer resources into going after employers, maybe because employers have political influence or because it's economically not a good idea to go after employers. So choices have been made in that arena, but it's not a choice to not enforce the law. It's a choice to think about a bunch of different issues simultaneously and try to balance them all together. Doris, how do you think immigration policy in this country needs to be changed? 
needs to be changed along the lines that Christina was talking about. There need to be sufficient legal ways for people to come to the country for work purposes. Right now, you can come, by and large, if you have a family connection. It's very, there are very few slots available, and those are set by statute to come here for work purposes. So we need a system that allows people to come legally when there is legitimate labor market demand. Now that labor market demand does not exist right now because we're in a recession, but it will come back at some future point and we do not have the kind of legal structure that allows for us to adapt and to be flexible in those up and down kinds of periods. But in addition to that, where the enforcement side is concerned, the enforcement side is extremely important. And when Christina talks about the choices that we've made as a country, those are political choices that the Congress has made to focus on border enforcement and not focus on employer enforcement. That's a fairly stark way of saying it, but that is really what the reality is. We have a strong consensus in this country across party lines, Democrat and Republican, across administrations, for increased border enforcement. Border enforcement is obviously important, it's essential. But the real issue with illegal immigration is employers and the job demand and the fact that there is a market for people to come to the country illegally. And Dan that has to be changed and that requires changes in our laws so that employers can verify who they're hiring. Well, let me ask you about that, Dan. Why, I mean, there are laws on the books uh, prohibiting the employment, right, of illegal immigrants by employers in this country. Why aren't those laws enforced to a greater degree, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, they're not enforced because there is a political coalition of the far left and the, a business coalition anchored by the Chamber of Commerce that works in Congress to fight against interior enforcement, strong employer sanctions, and you have division within both parties. The Democrats have become more polarized in favor of mass immigration and rewarding illegal immigration because of the voting patterns of the immigrants themselves now. Republicans have become more galvanized around stronger enforcement, but you still have opposition within their party from certain elements of the business wing. Now, you and I sat on Governor's Island, I think, almost 20 years ago, and I said at the time we needed a moratorium, a timeout on most immigration to restructure the preference system, which would have brought us to a lower number of overall immigration with higher skills compositions. Now, we would have eliminated the growth of the backlog, a lot of the incentive for illegal immigration. We could have redesigned an immigration system that would work for us, the American people. Right now, if we continue immigration at its current track, we're headed toward a billion people in this country, a billion people by the end of this century. Now, the opposition is arguing, well, people come illegally because there aren't enough ways to get in. Well, we've never had sustained immigration levels like we have had in American history. And we're, we have no end in sight despite the changing economic conditions the country now faces. This is a time when we have structural changes taking place in our labor market. The nation's economic needs will be dramatically changing in the next 20 or 30 years. And to the extent that we are a post-information, uh, industrial information society, we need far fewer immigrants, very highly skilled. We need to tell those people coming, you can come, you can bring spouse, unmarried minor children, but that is it. And if you want to go back and visit your relatives, that's fine, but you're not going to be bringing brothers and sisters and adult sons and daughters and that stuff. And then we need to have strong interior enforcement. If you re repeatedly violate immigration laws, you're not going to get a green card. We have to put incentives into the system and do things like Arizona. And with, with strong cooperation from the federal government, we can restore the incentives, which, you know, when my friends come from Europe studying our system, they are appalled to see that the states have no role in working with the federal government to verify status when people apply for jobs or apply for benefits or what have you. We, we're way out of step with the rest of the world. Well, you know, what, why do things, words like amnesty and path to citizenship so kind of make you twitch? Me? Yeah. Well, because, because, look, citizenship, respect for law is the cornerstone of citizenship. We have people who wait in line year after year for green cards, who respect our borders, respect our system of laws. Now, when you propose these amnesty bills, Katie, you have to look at the language, because not only are you forgiving law-breaking, not just the immigration law violations, but failure to file taxes, a variety of fraudulent ID violations, a range of felonies associated with being here illegally. 
that no American citizen could ever expect to enjoy. In addition to the forbearance from prosecution for all of those violations, they're being rewarded with a green card and attract a citizenship that puts them to, at an advantage, potentially, over people who played by the rules and respected our system of laws. How do you expect our country to be a model for the world? Why do people want to come to this country? Ultimately, if it isn't because the U.S. works, that if you play by the rules and you have a fair shake, you're getting a shot at the American dream. First and foremost, we want our borders and our system of law respected. We did the amnesty thing in 1986. It didn't work. We know why. And we don't want to walk down and make that same mistake again. Doris, I, I have to get you to react to that. Well, I think it's a pretty unfair characterization. The, the, all of the legislation that is being proposed, that is discussed, talks about legalization for people in the country illegally standing at the end of the line. All of the proposals recognize that there are people who have tried to use the immigration system who are in queues and who would receive their legal status visa first. But the legalization proposals also recognize that there are 10, 11 million people here in this country who have as a practical matter, contributed. They are in mixed families, some citizens, some with green cards, some with no legal status. It is impractical to try to deport those people, return them to their countries, and so they would be penalized. They would pay a big fine. They would be required to learn English. They would have to pay their back taxes. They would have to wait for at least 10 to 15 years before they would even be eligible for citizenship, given the numbers and the back of the queue idea. So the idea of a legalization is that if you do the rest of the things, if you put the proper enforcement structure into place, and we should give ourselves credit as a society for having learned some things since the last law passed and having much better technology available to us, which allows us to have a much stronger system of employer enforcement than was the case when prior laws were passed, then in combination with that, ultimately, you should recognize that those people who are here without a status should have a chance to pay their debt and get right with the law. Is there any common ground, Christina, between Dan's point of view and Doris's <laughs> point of view? Because obviously they're miles apart right now. Well, I do think that the, there's Actually, common ground. No, you don't it, think yeah. so? There's common ground in the belief that enforcement is important and that there should be considered thought given to how to enforce, I think. But also how to integrate these people in society. Right. That's what I mean, into, to, to uh, this country. I think this is where there are yeah, massive differences a between a the way these two see what should be done about the issue. And it's a divergence at step one about whether you should even be thinking about integration or whether that's an issue that would qualify as amnesty or would be rewarding law-breaking. And I think that the reality is that you have 11 million people who are integrated into the society in some way or another, and any democracy that is a wealthy democracy that attracts immigrants for economic reasons is going to have a very difficult time in uprooting people who have become embedded in society without violating some of the basic principles of a democratic society. And uh, Mr. Stein's European friends, a lot of those countries have rolling amnesties to deal with the problem of unauthorized immigration. They're controversial, but places like Spain and Italy and even France have provisions that recognize, okay, when some people have made lives in the country and the country itself is complicit in that because of its economic needs or because of its laws, then there needs to be a resolution that doesn't rely on draconian law enforcement alone, that also in incorporates ideas of integration. Have you talked to your European friends about that, Dan? Well, I've consulted, I've told a lot of my friends about a lot of things, but, you know, the history books and the evolution of civilization suggest that, you know, nation states either enforce their borders and retain control of their destinies, or they don't, and they cease to survive as nation states. And this, there will never be peace on the immigration question in the United States until we restore a sense of confidence that we, the people, through Congress, decide who's coming in and how many every year. 
and ultimately that immigration is serving up some purpose that's consistent with the range of domestic priorities we have as a nation. You know, whether it's our environment and population growth or, or congestive effects of infrastructure and education and housing and criminal justice and social service costs and health care. Um, you know, in the end, immigration, the way it's being practiced today, appears to be burdening just about all the things Americans would like to see actually made less of a burden at, for the convenience of employers who want to use immigration to reduce labor costs and undermine bargaining leverage. And frankly, you know, the immigrants themselves who obviously feel they're getting an advantage by coming here. I mean, a society with a social safety net, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an income floor that's designed to guarantee through anti-poverty programs a decent standard of living, also has to have perimeter controls, or else it's mandating bankruptcy, national bankruptcy on the service providers and state and local taxpayers. And places like California, Illinois, Texas, Arizona, Florida, New York, they're all seeing that while immigration per se is not the sole cause of the fiscal crisis, when you bring in large numbers of people without the education, skills, and ability to provide the value added to pay the significant taxes associated with people's social costs in a society with our elaborate social safety system, you are actually subsidizing. We taxpayers are simply subsidizing the so-called low-cost labor, and we simply cannot afford to continue doing this. Doris? Well, nobody argues that this is a broken system. This is not the, what's happening today is absolutely indefensible. It's wrong. This is not the way people should be coming to the country. But we th but that's the whole point about immigration reform and about tackling the problem of putting a legal structure into place that does serve our interests and makes it possible for us to make choices on who should come and who should not come and then enforce those choices. That's not what we have right now and things like the Arizona law don't solve that problem. The problem can only be solved by an overhaul of our immigration laws that recognizes that we have to have effective enforcement as compared to laws on the books that, although they're on the books, are very weak and difficult and often impossible to enforce, so that a system of enforcement that's workable can actually be put into place, that we then recognize that the people who are here illegally should be able to pay a fine and stay, and that in the future we have a flexible enough system so that when our economy has particular needs for workers, and they will tend to be more highly skilled workers, that we have a mechanism to bring them in according to the rules in ways that we choose. None of that is possible unless we pass laws that make it possible. And Dan, do you believe that, that uh immigrants take jobs away from Americans? Is that, I mean, obviously you, you, you believe that they're putting a massive strain on our social safety net and on taxpayers, but do you, do you believe that, that illegal immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans? Yeah, well, you said illegal immigrants, okay. Illegal immigrants, any, anybody who is a... Or immigrants, a if you wanted to well, say, all immigrant, immigrants. Anybody who has a substitute level of skills, who's a substitute for an American worker, by definition increases labor supply in that niche and erodes bargaining leverage for American workers. In construction, service industries, places where people illegally have been working, there's no question about it. Now, I know you can say, oh, look at this guy working 18 hours a day for cash under the table. No American would do that job. That's because we have jobs that aren't paying a decent living wage. The, the work would get done without the illegal workers here. It would be done by fewer American workers being paid far higher wages. And what about stability... the cost of goods that might might result from from that workforce? I'm just curious. Do you think I Americans have, when, are willing to... What, ha what happened to our society that the level of social distance has creeped into the point where we've now become a two-tier society where those of us driving our Jaguars and our Volvos and our Mercedes look at there's this different class of people who do the 
the dirty work. The stability of our 20th century uh, political experiment was built on the strength of a stable middle class from the, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, the civil rights movement, strong unionization, the, the narrowing of the gap between wealthy and poor. Uh, engineers and lawyers didn't make that much more than people who were unionized workers in mass production consumption industries. We are now relegating a lot of, of service jobs in, in agriculture and food it's to a, a form, kind of a modern form of indenture, where people are apparently not expected to be paid a decent living wage, you know, in exchange for their, for their willingness to come here and be exploited. That is... First of all, we're destroying the American middle class. The native-born population with high school degree or less is dropping out of the labor force. We see the people who are most highly impacted by illegal immigration, the least able to defend themselves politically and financially. It, it has been a sociological disaster, which now, in the wake of this contracting economy with structural unemployment, people desperate for any kind of a job are suddenly finding themselves colliding in whole industries where they, you know, they don't hire so-called Native American workers anymore. And that's part of why you see this incendiary response arising politically all across the country over an economic model that might have been acceptable during a debt-infused financial bubble that we had in the last decade is no longer sustainable. Uh, and we need to go back to the basic principle that we're all connected as Americans together and that the less educated among us still need to have a tight enough labor supply that employers will have the incentive to provide wages, working conditions, and benefits. And Doris, the only way you're going to do that is by controlling the growth of the labor supply. And, and Doris, what, what is your take on that? Do you believe that, that this is preventing Americans who want to find work from getting work because they're being given to people who are basically being paid under the table and and not being compensated adequately? Well, certainly some illegal immigrants are exploited. Some illegal immigrants, actually the majority, are actually being paid above the table and employers are paying into the Social Security system. So it's a mixture of all of those factors. It's not the right way to do things. We should not have illegal immigration, but it is not entirely uh, a, a, an abject, exploited labor force either, even though some within it are. The, and isn't you know, this, this when the employer, I was going to say, sh isn't this when the employers should be taken to task too and these laws yeah, should be absolutely. enforced? Absolutely. And, 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 the, <laughs> the, and, and I will tell you, as somebody who was at one time responsible for trying to enforce those laws, they are extraordinarily weak and it is very difficult to actually bring successful cases. The federal government has tried in a whole variety of ways to do so. Those laws need to be strengthened and there needs to be a system in place for verifying the legal status of people that employers are hiring. That is going to take new laws. But this bigger global picture that, uh, that Dan has painted of all of the things that are going on and connecting all of that to immigration is really way beyond what it is that you can hold immigra illegal immigration responsible for. I mean, illegal immigration is part, and the, the kind of a society that we live in today is part of a broad set of changes that has to do with the international economy, with globalization. The thing that we haven't talked about is aging. For the first time, we are a society, and all major advanced industrial societies are societies that are aging. We are no longer producing enough younger workers in good times for the jobs that the economy produces. So we will need immigration into the future, but we need immigration that we're in charge of where we set the terms and where we can turn the spigots higher or lower based on our labor markets and our national interests. Well, it's obviously a very complex mm -hmm. issue. Christina, most Americans support this law mm -hmm. in Arizona, which I think shows, illustrates an underlying frustration with, which I think all three of you agree that the current system is broken yes. as it exists today. Um, you know, what, what do you see as the solution, as we've just discussed, it is extremely complicated. Um, and if there's any kind of way out or any kind of fair mm -hmm. way to treat people, I mean, we are built on a nation of immigrants, Dan, and I know you you agree with that. Um, but at the same time, there has to be some kind of system 
that mm -hmm. doesn't wreak havoc with with uh, you know the people who are here legally. Mm -hmm. So what is the answer? <laughs> so I think those polls are very interesting because it's it's clear that the majority of the public supports the Arizona law, but the polls also show that 60 up to 70 percent, depending on political party, also support legalization. So I think there you have part of your answer. You have on the one hand the desire for a system that actually can be enforced where the rule of law can be upheld, but at the same time a system that allows for the integration of people who are already here. And I think that the, the last component of it, and Doris has alluded to this and I mentioned it as well, is opening up opportunities for entry. And I, I was going to say, should it be easier to be, come to this country be, and become a citizen yes. and would that sort of reduce the number of people who come here illegally. I think that if there were more opportunities for entry, it would reduce illegal immigration. And I think the key... Um, Dan is, Dan I, is shaking I can his see head. from you my probably, vision shaking, yeah, exactly. shaking his head. But I, I just want to make this one point, and that's that there's this belief that the United States can solve this problem with respect to its interests alone. But there, as Dora suggested, is a world out there. And there are labor market issues, integration issues, trade issues that help produce the flows of migration that are coming. And no matter how badly you want immigration to be the most highly skilled of the world to make America great again, the world has a different idea about the movement of people. And people in other parts of the world have a different idea about where they belong and where their opportunities lie. And so I think the system needs to be flexible enough to accommodate shifts in the labor market that are not things that the United States government can control by itself. Surely enforcement is a piece of it, but that are also shaped by factors outside of the United States. And until the United States realizes that we have this 3,000 mile border with Mexico that w over which there has been traffic for centuries and that that's a relationship that has to be managed and embraced, then you're not going to have a permanent solution to the crisis. You may have dips in unauthorized immigration, but unless you make it a legal process, you're not going to eliminate the problem altogether. I'm going to give you each 15 seconds to give your closing thought, Dan. Uh, I'll start with you. Well, I'll just say that, you know, when Dora says that there's no consensus to do X or Y, what she really means is that there are special interests in Washington on the left and on the right, mostly business on the right, who operate aggressively to obstruct the changes needed to get enforcement working and effective and under control. I do not want to bequeath to my grandchildren a country of over a billion people, and that's where we're headed. We need to reduce overall immigration, put a cap on it, eliminate extended chain migration through the family preference system. I don't think we have the, uh, uh, the ability to simply skim off the cream of the technical talent around the rest of the world for much longer. There are other places they're going to be going. We need to, a country should do its own work, and we should focus our energy on getting our young people today trained up in the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and, and, and grow, believe once again that we can do the job ourselves. And that's, that's the future for America if we're going to be successful as a society. And Doris, how about you? What, would you like, what thought would you like to leave us with today? Well, I think Arizona is the wrong way to go about fixing this problem. I hope it brings enough attention to the issue so that we can finally get the politics in Congress to be passing more intelligent laws. But I think the very important thing about changing our laws is that although we certainly do need to strengthen enforcement, the most important thing that has to accompany enforcement is a system that looks to the future that is sufficiently flexible to recognize that immigration needs to be part of our future, that that immigration that needs to be part of our future will probably span all skill levels, but that it's very critical that we put a system into place that can get the confidence of the public, of the American people, because the job of integrating newcomers into our society, the challenges of diversity in our society, which are an enormous strength for us as a country, always have been, need to continue to be part of that future. All right. Well, Dan Stein and Doris Meisner and Christina Rodriguez, you know, I'm afraid we've only skimmed the surface because it is such a complex issue. But I, I, my only hope is that we've given people a little more information so they can continue to have this conversation, learn more about what's going on and, and some of the proposals that are on the table and, and really continue to talk about it. So 
they can form an informed uh, position on this. I thank you all so much for your time and uh, for your reasonable, you. rational, conversational abilities. Because <laughs> you don't find that that often, do you? Because uh, I know it's thank you for Thank you for devoting the time to it. All right. Thank you all so much. And, and I didn't get to many tweets, and I'm sorry about that because I had to follow this sort of complex conversation. But we really appreciate those who tweeted and with their questions. Hopefully some of them were answered, even if I didn't give you full credit for the question. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Katie Couric. And you can see, by the way, all the episodes of this web show anytime at CBSNews.com. And now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove.